Hello and welcome to Troubleshooting Zen Study and Practice number 38. And this month our question is, Sometimes I find it difficult to stay awake during Zazen, especially at the beginning of sessions. Why is this? Okay, so um, just to remind ourselves that in fact the uh, last uh, uh, troubleshooting, number 37, actually dealt with lethargy. Um, so it might be useful in some ways to go back and have a listen to that. Uh, but here this question very specifically relates to Zazen, which is uh, sitting meditation um, uh, in Zen, which is done either on a cushion or on a chair um, or on a bench. Uh, and also Sashins. Sashins is uh, the term for a Zen uh, Buddhist retreat. So these retreats can be for a day, they can be for a couple of days, they can be five days, they can be for seven days. Um, some other traditions uh, sit very long retreats. Uh, Theravadans will sit uh, a retreat in some cases for 40 days. The Tibetans will also do uh, you can do some for a year um, or even over, uh, but in Zen they tend to be uh, more short and frequent. So if you're living in a temple or in a monastery, certainly, uh, you may find that there are monthly uh, sessions which will last for a week normally. Uh, there are particular sessions that are uh, uh, carried out at certain times of the year. So for example, the Rahatsu session, which runs from the 1st of December through to the morning of the 8th of December, uh, is which commemorates the Buddha's enlightenment, is a uh, relatively well-known one, as is the one that takes place in January, known as the Great Winter Session. Uh, both of those are considered uh, quite harsh sessions. And basically a session, a retreat, a Zen retreat, uh, is has uh, many more uh, periods of Zazen. Uh, sitting meditation and so you might be sitting for anywhere from eight to ten hours a day in the case of Rahatsu it may be even longer than that in fact the monks uh, don't lie down uh, is that's the tradition they don't actually lie down throughout the uh, session at all if they sleep they can sleep informally for about three hours I think uh, it, it has to take place on the cushion itself so they're periods of quite intense sitting meditation. Um, they're done under strict conditions. Uh, it's silent, there's no speaking. Obviously, there's no reading or mobile phones or anything like that. This is a retreat, and as the word retreat uh, suggests, it's a retreat from the world uh, uh, as well. So that's a little bit about what the uh, what this question is about. This person is saying, who's obviously been on several retreats, several sessions, they find it quite difficult to stay awake in Zazen uh, during uh, a session, and particularly, uh, particularly at the beginning uh, of this as well. Um, now, perhaps just first to give a little bit more context, why, why do people actually sit sessions? Well, it's certainly used to deepen the practice. And if we remember in the, at the beginning of uh, the tradition in Buddhism, the monks and nuns, the Sangha, as they were known, the ordained Sangha, retreated from life, retreated from the ha life of the householder, from the village, from the town, and they would go out into the forest or into the mountains, into a remote place, and there they would build themselves small meditation huts where they would live and they would practice, and they would come together usually for a sermon and also for the alms round once a day but apart from that they would be on their own they would be almost in sort of semi-permanent retreat semi-permanent session and then on top of that they would also have uh, full retreats as well so it's a very controlled life it's a very cut down and restrained life and the purpose of that or the purpose of reducing outer activity was to uh, begin to investigate inwardly and one of the things that people notice when going on a session uh, is that their inner life their inner thoughts the inner video the inner commentator seems to get dialed up uh, certainly at the beginning because of the lack of stimulation coming from outside because we cannot sit down and switch on Netflix or listen to music uh, do all those usual things that are more outward facing um, quite naturally the attention begins to turn inward and we and, and that inner uh, 
uh, sort of dream maker, the daydream maker, if you like, can actually get really dialed up. And that's part of the process uh, to investigate what the heart is doing and why it's doing certain things. Remember that Buddhism is all always about uh, insight. It's about insight into the working of one's own heart and mind. Uh, and so sessions provide a really good opportunity for that. The other thing that they're extremely useful for is for honing the skill of meditation itself and honing the skill of mindfulness practice itself so that when we leave the session uh, and we go back into our daily lives, we have have sharpened up the instrument of attention, of the ability to be able to give ourselves uh, more wholeheartedly into the circumstances, which is the heart of our practice, uh, to give myself wholeheartedly away into whatever at this moment is being done uh, with the body and with the heart and with everything. That, that's what wholeheartedly means, obviously. And that it, period, short, frequent periods of, in, of more intense training allows us to hone up that skill. So that's why uh, it's done. So, but again, um, the interesting thing about sessions and having myself been on sessions for uh, 30 years now is that they are often very different from, um, one from another. And um, I've also run uh, sessions um, and it's fascinating because outwardly everybody appears to be pretty much the same sometimes one or two people do have some difficulties and you know we have ways of dealing with uh, with those difficulties as they arise however inwardly people can have very very different experiences uh, of the same session uh, some may find it very relaxing and uh, energizing and making vital and other people can really have quite a lot of turmoil uh, it can stir things up for people because sitting obviously for longer periods of time not having those outward distractions means that uh, the uh, some of the sort of complexes some of the psychological uh, uh, traits that we have that perhaps we don't look at, some of the sort of repressed material can begin to float up into consciousness and you know that's why we need the sort of the backing of the whole practice uh, to be able to uh, deal with this material as it emerges into conscious awareness. The ability to, part of that is the, the restraint, having the restraint uh, the other part of that is being able to declutch to a degree from the material so that we're not quite so carried away by it. Sometimes it can still do that. Um, having the support of others around one obviously is a big factor in allowing us to almost unconsciously have the faith of and the trust in the process and staying where we are. Um, that, that, that really is a big uh, is a big factor. Obviously, having someone to talk to about it. There are at certain times. There is uh, obviously on retreats, on sessions. There's an opportunity for an interview to go and talk with a teacher about what may be coming up. And the purpose of that is a little bit like the pressure cooker. You know, you can release a little bit of pressure. You don't release release too much because that pressure is cooking. It is actually cooking. Uh, uh, the food or cooking the ingredients, uh, so to speak. And, and that's um, part of the reason that we're there. Sessions really can be uh, pivotal or uh, initiatory, really. They can initiate a change or catalyze a change, a, a genuine transformation of heart. And attachments do, can and do fall off and can fall off permanently uh, in a session. Uh, so it's 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 a careful cooking process between overdoing and underdoing um and which is why it's not always wise just to if you've not really much experience of <coughs> sorry sitting meditation of zazen or of daily life practice and particularly working with the emotional household working with the fires as it's sometimes called um if that isn't well established it's it's not always a good idea to go on a longer retreat or shall we just say you can be taking a bit more of a risk and um, you know uh, although you know people I've certainly known people with uh, mental health problems who have certainly gone on retreats but in all cases those people have had solid uh, sitting uh, 
uh, Zazen experience behind them and daily life experience behind them as well for quite some time. Um, and they've gone on it and they've been absolutely fine. Uh, so it's certainly, you know, uh, not a case that some people uh, have to be excluded. The only the only exclusion really is if you've not had a lot of experience doing it. Some people do. You know, I've known people who've gone on uh, long retreats with very little sitting experiences and whilst it's been very tough physically and mentally they were absolutely fine so you know again uh, that has to be said too uh, but I think in in my own experience I, I wouldn't necessarily have advised someone to as it were jump in the deep end I'd say go and establish your daily life practice your mindfulness practice your zazen practice first when you can sit an hour of zazen comfortably six days a week um, you know, and you're comfortable with that, then you're ready, you know, then you are, uh, you can be ready to go uh, uh, with that. So anyway, but it, what that does mean is that the experiences on uh, a session can be very different uh, one to the other. And, and even for the same person, you know, the second, third, fourth, fifth time they go on a session, uh, again, can produce very varied experiences. And it can be quite intense as well. And part of that intensity actually has to do about energy management. And by energy management, I mean the sort of the energy of life or uh, perhaps uh, more technically, we could call it the energy of the Buddha nature. The Buddha nature itself, this, this fountain of life that exists and emerges from our own heart that powers our inner life and also our outer life as well. Um, what's known through the three doors of our actions of body, speech and mind, is all energetic. Um, and, and it's about the management and the cultivation of that energy. Now, as I've said, when, when people are in their ordinary lives, and particularly now, and we, now we sort of come on to uh, the matter of this question of, of why is it that people of, can often fall asleep uh, during the first part of the session. And I think a major part of that is simply the change of pace and the fact that, as I've said, a lot of the outer stimulation um, has been removed. And without that stimulation, it's as if something in the body says, oh, switch off. Um, a little bit, I've seen it similar with people when they go on holiday. So, you know, people who go, say, have a two-week holiday, if they have very busy lives with lots of demands on them, quite often the first three or four days, they just want to sleep. They want to lie on the beach um, or lie by the pool under an umbrella and snooze, you know, for several hours. And and in a way, they're, they're sort of playing catch-up because... Um, statistically, you know, a lot of people do not get enough sleep, um, and this is this is a problem. Over a long period of time, we build up a debt, a sleep debt, and so when when suddenly we change the pace of things, um, the body takes advantage quite naturally. So there's 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 a little bit of that as well, and, and for that there is a thing known as zazen sleep. Um, where you can actually get a really good level of rest uh, sitting formally on your chair or on your cushion in the zazen position. You don't. It's not true that you you can only rest when lying down horizontally. You really can. I mean, I mean, this is the monks and nuns um, show this during the rahatsu session. You know, where they where they are on their cushions um, all the way through the night and they don't lie down. Um, you know, you no one could go a week with absolutely no rest and sleep at all. So it is possible uh, to do that, and it's it's a bit difficult to explain. And it's maybe that would be um, to, zazen sleep can be a, a, a separate question at another time. If if you're interested, uh, you can always uh, write in uh, to the Zen Gateway um, at rinzai at the Zen Gateway dot com. Rinzai is R I N Z A I as in Master Rinzai, Rinzai at the Zen Gateway .com, where you can send all your questions. Um, so if you're interested in Zazen sleep, um, send over a question. So coming back to, uh, coming back to this uh, question of sort of sleepiness uh, during this time, that certainly, you know, will be a part of it. That certainly can be a part of it, simply that we are, we are catching up. Uh, 
that happens and, and, and the telltale for that is that it happens at the beginning and then you come out of that maybe on the second day, something like that, maybe on the third day, suddenly you feel really awake and you feel really awake. And quite often you can have a period of... Um, it's very pleasant, actually, be quite blissful. You're experiencing the, the session as quite sort of... You're very present. The senses are much more sharp. They're acute. There's a sensitivity to things. And there's an openness and a more at peace, a feeling of being more at peace for things. And this can um, alternate between that state and then something will come up. Maybe it's boredom. Maybe it's one of these unconscious uh, complexes or something like that that suddenly emerges into consciousness. It can be a fear. It can be a desire. You know, you can. We can go from thinking, "Oh wow, Zen is the absolute bee's knees," and then you know, four hours later, we think we're ready to give up. The whole thing's a nonsense. Why am I wasting my time? I could be doing something far more productive with my time than this sort of nonsense and back again. So, you know, all those little things can catch fire uh, in consciousness at a session. And in a way, we are learning to recognize these as the six states on the wheel of life. And we're learning to recognize their passing uh, quality, the fact that they are impermanent and that they are delusive and that their intensity is what makes them so real and just a, a quick story on that how that intensity can fool us in a slightly different situation um, I remember going to see this was back in the 1990s um, I used to work in HR and sort of these motivational speakers were the big thing at the time I don't know if they still are uh, but they certainly were then and I went to see one um, you know it wasn't one of the massive named people but he was a charismatic guy and very good and uh, it was fascinating you know he did all sorts of tricks and stuff and the the whole room was galvanized and I remember you know we were all sort of sitting on the edge of our seat and um, you know we were all and then every every so often in between these these sort of displays uh, he would have of various sort of mind-bending things he would sort of drop out certain pithy aphorisms, which we would all sort of write down and I would write down, you know. And uh, I got home and I thought, oh, I had a really fantastic evening, really enjoyed that. And the following morning, I, I picked up the uh, notebook that I had written these sayings down, my notes, and I read through them. And it was the most banal, you know, unimaginative nonsense, um, you know, like those motivational posters that you sometimes get or those memes, you know, you can be anything you want to be, you know, you're only limited by your imagination and all that sort of guff. And it's it was fascinating because, um, you know, it, it's very appealing. But what was what was different was the emotional intensity. And that's why I taught, say that, that sessions are about energy management because emotions don't forget that the the word emotion has the same root as the word to motivate because uh, that's what emotions do emotions motivate us they move us to action of body speech and mind and with that the um you know once that intensity subsides then you sort of see you know uh, what you've written in the sort of cool light of day, so to speak, without that intensity, uh, without that great power. And uh, it ceases to be divine revelation and becomes banal. So, um, yeah, uh, <laughs> which a lot of this stuff is, you know, I mean, let's be honest. And if you say, oh, well, you know, maybe that's just a delusion. Well, the reason it's not is is because... A lot of those memes, a lot of those statements are overly simplistic of often more complex situations. Uh, and, you know, life is nuanced at its best uh, because of its variety. Um, you know, and I don't think that's too controversial a statement. At least I hope not. Anyway, uh, so coming back to it, yes, it's about that energy management. It's about being able to declutch, but it's also about, as it were, turning that energy round so that it flows back into the practice, into the zazen, which is why, 
you know, when it goes really well, the senses are so sharp and we are experiencing life more fully. What we're experiencing is the power of the Buddha nature itself as it flows into the present moment uh, and, and wakens it up, uh, as it were, it conjoins with it. Because life is not just something that happens to us, it's also something that uh, we... We are ex we are creating through our own experience as well. This is a uh, this is the way that uh, uh, Buddhism sees our living in the world. So it's about this is what sentience actually is. So um, a lot of different things can happen to us, and perhaps just one final point is is what happens when we come back to our ordinary lives, when we come back into the world, when we cease to retreat from the world but come back to it it could be a bit of a shock actually first of all particularly i remember you know we used to have our uh our retreats our sessions at a little catholic priory um down outside of london uh, south of london and then we would get the train and we would come back into you know a busy um railway station in the city and you get out and it was a little bit like a slap in the face uh, to begin with because of the noise uh, it doesn't take that long to adjust back but one thing i noticed though interestingly is that because the the power of restraint had been provided by the external environment when i came back uh, to london you know like the following day i would go back to work and i would actually find myself a little bit more temperamental than normal um you know a little bit more sweary maybe um when things didn't go the way i wanted them to and you may sort of think oh well um that didn't work terribly well well it does actually because it it shows that there's still plenty of work to do uh, but what's happened is that because of the lack of outside stimulation that the normal leakiness um, of our power uh, of our of our strength of the Buddha nature has been conserved uh, and now going back into the life that the tendency is that all the cracks open up again and it all goes blah uh, as it were and and we used to give a regular warning when people were driving back home from the session we would always say drive carefully you've accumulated a lot of energy you may not realize it but the tendency is to want to put the foot down to speed um, so be careful, apply that restraint until you get home and at least you can sleep on it. So yeah, um, <clears throat> this acknowledgement of, of the energy management is, uh, is important. So a few uh, tips and hints hopefully about sessions for people who uh, are uh, perhaps contemplating going on a session. Uh, you know, if you're in a regular practice, you genuinely should uh, consider it. Uh, if you have one available um, that you can go on. Um, so yes, and as I say, um, as I said before, if you have any other questions for the troubleshooting series, uh, don't forget to send them over to the usual address. You can always find our contact details on our homepage, uh, which is www.thezengateway.com. Till the next time.